um, I like to think of these webinars as kind of setting the stage for the Friday field tour. So imagine with me that we're all standing around at maybe at a parking area by a landing. Um, and we want to just give a little introduction to what we're going to be seeing on Friday and what we're going to be talking about. So to help you with that today, climate change uh, in the context of, uh, of uh, mixed hardwood forests and looking at it through the lens of Western Maine, specifically the Rangeley area, we have a whole range of awesome speakers that are going to provide really good uh, brief, but really, really good insight into kind of the regional context, talking about hardwood management in the climate change context, um, talking about what is the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust doing for hardwoods management? Um, what does that mean for wildlife and what, what are landowners supposed to make of all of that? So um, without further ado, I'd love to uh, kick it off to our first speakers. So Christine Parrish is going to start us off with a regional context, um, bringing, uh, and, Please feel free to introduce yourselves and your background, but we're mostly diving into content here. So Christine, thank you so much for leading us off with the regional context. Sure, Amanda, thanks. This is gonna be a quick drive by. Um, I'm Christine Parrish. I'm the Western Maine Project Specialist for the New England Forestry Foundation, and I work across Western Maine. I'm gonna share my screen with you, um, take a look sort of at the broad brush uh, of where we are. I just, you know, everybody knows about the Arctic and the ocean influences in Maine. The area that we're looking at, if my pen is gonna work, is the Acadian forest, basically Adirondacks up through Western Maine, up into the provinces, uh, forgive my messy outline there, but this is generally the area that we're, that uh, we're Christine, talking sorry, about. There it is. Oh, there we go, the screen shared. Just yeah, took a moment sorry, to catch up I with just, you. I just drew that area that I was just talking about. Sorry about that. Um, and this is the area of transition. This is the transition forest. And so, um, there we go, there's my slides. This is where the Northern hardwood forests overlap. Um, and there's some priority bird, bird species associated with that with the, um, with the Northern softwood forest. So you have those hardwoods overlapping with the spruce fir forest across this about 24 to 26 million um, uh, acre area from Adirondacks up through the provinces. And this is just going to scale it into Western Maine. We've got about five million acres in Western Maine, uh, and and this is this is an interesting area for a whole bunch of reasons. We have a, a transitional forest overlap. We have the elevation from about six hundred to over five thousand feet. This area of about five million acres has all of Maine's high elevation habitats, and it has the last big blocks of undeveloped forest uh, across this area. So there's three really key things that are happening here that allow this to be a habitat rich area, climate resilient, and allow an opportunity for improvement uh, as we go forward. Cold, clear streams. Just a reminder, you know, this area has the best native trout, uh, brook trout habitat left in the east. I love them. Um, some of the best uh, uh, migratory bird habitat left in the lower 48. You can see with National Audubon Society mapped out there, that huge red chunk of Western and Northwest Maine, one of the best places left in the country. This is one of the beneficiaries. I'd like to point out the Canada Warbler, one of my favorite has lost, um, don't quote me on this, but I think it's about 70% of its population over the last 40 years, flies up from the Andes, spends a couple months up here eating uh, um, caterpillars and nesting in mossy forest floors and is in desperate need of some habitat help. I like to show this one last before turning it over. Um, I think this, this is a satellite image uh, at night. We know with the development of the South Coast and the Boston to Washington DC corridor, we forget sometimes how much development is to the west of us in Canada. And you can see that Maine, that Western Maine particularly is this big dark spot on this map at night. It's also uh, a big connector between the Adirondacks, the forest, the forest in the Adirondacks over across New Hampshire, Vermont, and up into the provinces. You'll also notice as we're looking at scale that Rangeley Lakes is right, uh, I work on about two, two and a quarter million acres of this, uh, New England Forestry Foundation does, Rangeley Lakes right in the middle of it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shelby. If I can get out a screen share here. There you go. Thanks so much, Christine. Go ahead, Shelby. 
Hello, I'm Shelby Russo. I'm the deputy director in um, development, uh, I'm sorry, stewardship director for the Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust. Um, I don't have any slides to show you. Um, we're not that technologically savvy this afternoon. We're having some technological issues. Um, but since 1991, Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust has acquired lands for conservation from a variety of landowners and managers and with different reasons for acquiring them. Some lands have some existing recreational assets and some are required required to connect those assets to others, such as um, international trail systems for snowmobiling and so forth. Uh, many of our lands were acquired to enhance wildlife habitats and corridors, and of course, some are even required to reduce the development impacts of those natural resource areas. Regardless, RLHT's area of interest is within the mosaic of historic work and forests that represent and influence the cultural and social aspects of the Ranger Lakes region for the past 100 years. Um, the, strip, the slides that um, she showed you previously obviously covers the area of our interest, um, which is right up to uh, Western Maine to where it butts the, the little corner of Canada and New Hampshire. We'll show you some more pictures on, on um, Friday or some pictures on Friday when you come to the um, event. When Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust looks at lands to potentially conserve, we review them at the, the stewardship staff level, and then we roll it into our lands and acquisition and stewardship committee, and then finally into our board level, who then approves it um, or disapproves it. We have five critical areas or elements that are reviewed to ensure that the acquisition fits into our uh, mission. Um, and these include the ecological access, scenic community and public benefit values. Um, as some of you may know, we are for stewardship council certified. We're third party certified, the trust to conserve the Northeast forest land. And we're also for stewardship council, um, sorry, land trust accreditation um, accredited. So um, that was sort of pretty broad, very um, flying at 10,000 feet. We'll tell you more on Friday. Um, and I, I hope that you um, have some questions um, that we can answer on Friday. Hello everyone. My name is Jason Latham. I recently started with the Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust as their natural resource specialist. And today I'm filling in for Walker Day and he's our contracted forester with the Seven Islands Land Management Company. Uh, I'll be sharing some of the information uh, that I discussed with him yesterday about our hardwood management. The Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust Comprehensive Forest Ecosystem Management Plan is currently in the process of evolving. We're utilizing information obtained from the Enhanced Forest Inventory Project, State Flown High Resolution LIDAR, the Barbara Wheatland Geospatial Lab, University of Maine Orono, and inventory calibration plots and yield curve projections from the Seven Islands Land Company. We're also using unmanned aircraft systems or drone technology as a remote sensing tool for forest management activities and monitoring. <clears throat> so prior to any timber harvest, careful planning is taken to ensure that the operation follows a silvicultural prescription that defines which trees are to be cut and an understanding of what the stand residual will look like. So trees are physically designated and the harvester has a clear understanding of the management plan goals following recommended best management practices all haul roads landing areas skid trails and water crossings are laid out beforehand sensitive areas such as wetlands riparian zones and ecologically significant natural communities are identified by cruising the stand and utilizing gis once harvesting begins, the landowner and forester ensure that the prescription is being followed and no necessary damage is occurring. The Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust hardwood program is really focused on silvicultural prescriptions that promote forest stand health, structure, and ecosystem health. Seven Islands largely employs single tree and occasionally group selection harvests, and by selecting selectively harvesting unacceptable growth stock, diseased, damaged, and less vigorous trees. The growth of residual acceptable growth stock is enhanced and optimal stocking is achieved. These periodic thinnings, usually around 20 year rotations, release desirable intermediate and shade tolerant tree species, such as yellow birch and sugar maple. Currently, Seven Islands is not overly concerned with salvaging white ash in response to emerald ash borers. And as Walker Day put it, 
Seven Islands is not a management company that believes the sky is falling because of emerald ash borers, but the Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust is committed to monitoring forests for insects and disease activity annually or post-disturbance activities. In hardwood stands where American beech is present, it is rarely harvested regardless of its resistance or infestation of beech scale disease. Uh, this is in part due to its value as a hard mass producing tree for wildlife and beech's tendency to respond to cutting by producing vigorous root sprouts. Our goal is to maintain at least four snags or cavity trees per acre to benefit wildlife. We also retain inclusions of smaller ecologically significant natural communities and softwood stands within the broader stand type. And retention of mixed wood stands provides a diversity of habitat, thus encouraging increased wildlife species diversity. Seven Islands does not enter lands that contain less than 24 cords an acre and do not move remove more than 10 acres of the overstory. The management practices result in healthy, resilient, une uneven age stands for various age classes. And any revenue generated by sustainable timber harvest is not a priority, but a welcome result of good management. And as Shelby mentioned, the Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust is Forest Stewardship Council certified and land trust accredited. And these will serve as our guiding principles. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you, Christine, for that zoom in from the broader region all the way down into uh, Ranger Lakes Heritage Trust hardwood stands. So I know that that was a lot of information really quickly. And uh, Alec Giffen is going to go next, I believe, and expand on the civil cultural aspects of what does hardwood management look like in a climate change context. Okay, and I'm also going to put this in a bigger frame of what the opportunities are that New England's forests offer for mitigating climate change. So keep in mind that my comments are going to be about um, the future and what could be rather than uh, exactly what we have markets for today, what we can uh, justify in terms of financial terms today. But we've done analyses New England-wide that show that the opportunities to mitigate climate change um, through uh, improved forest management are huge. And Christine, could you pull up that slide? Uh, and our conclusion is that if you look New England-wide, uh, and this is a graphic that shows it, up at the top, it shows the portion of what we need to do to get to net zero. And it turns out that what we need to, what, what we could do with forests is about 30% of what we need to do to get to net zero. And this is over 600 million metric tons CO2E uh, over the course of the next 25 years or so, which it'll take to implement it. And that's equivalent to taking a million cars off the road for over a century. So the point here is that through improved forest management, using more wood uh, instead of other materials, et cetera, et cetera, New England's forests present a huge opportunity uh, going forward. And lest this sound uh, Herculean and impossible, we are working to make this possible by providing funding to landowners and loggers um, through a uh, Climate Smart Commodities Grant that we're going to be applying for. We expect it to be in the range of $40 million uh, with the bulk of the money going to landowners and loggers for practices that we know will increase uh, carbon storage in the forest, carbon storage in product and substitution. We're also working with um, Aaron Weiskettle uh, at the university on a project which is called the Focal Project, FCCL, which is looking at forest management on 9 million acres and figuring out what practices are going to increase carbon storage um, the most and what it would cost to do that. In addition, we're also working, we've created a corporation called the Exemplary Forestry Investment Fund, um, where we're looking to pair philanthropic money with uh, 
uh, money from investors in order to manage um, forests going forward consistent uh, with our standards, which will help mitigate uh, climate change. So how is this possible to mitigate climate change? So the big picture is active management on lands that are not actively managed currently. And we know that for many family forest landowners, particularly in Southern New England, that's the case. But for family forest landowners kind of across the region. Um, secondly, we need to maintain harvest levels um, by increasing thinning and improving productivity. Third thing we need to do is we need to increase the stocking on understocked in understocked stands. And the um, silviculture that we have modeled that we have found uh, that can serve these goals while at the same time improving wildlife habitat and increasing the productivity of the forest are largely uh, small irregular gaps uh, on 20% of the landscape at 20 year intervals and thinning from below uh, in between. So Christine, if you could show Jen's slides, you may again say, uh, okay, leave that one up. So this is what happens, whoops, go back. So this is what happens if you pr practice this kind of forestry in the forest of average condition for Northwestern Maine in terms of carbon stocks. And what you can see from this graph is that the carbon stocks per acre increase by about 30 metric tons within 25 years. They go above that, but they never go below that if you maintain that kind of management. So Jen's slides, Christine. Um, so again, you may say, keep going. You may say, is this possible to do? Keep going, keep going. Well, I'll pause here. This is an example from a field trip that we had of same stand. The one on the left is unthinned. The one on the right is thin. Bottom line is the one on the right, and these are both 40 years of age, established in clear cuts 40 years ago. The one on the right is, according to Weyerhaeuser, going to be ready for harvest in about 10 years. The one on the left, who knows how long it's going to take to get there. Keep going. Um, that's the end of my slides. OK, so you don't have the ones from Jen. All right, so let me just tell you what those slides would have shown. They're examples from four or five uh, different NEF properties uh, and also um, Wikipedia Woods, which many of you are familiar with, that it is indeed possible to both maintain harvest levels and increase stocking over a period of 30 years. This is not speculation. Those graphs are all based on real world experience and show that indeed it's possible. So bottom line is we have a huge opportunity with our forests. We know how to do it. And um, we're working to try and create the financial incentives that will make this possible. That's it. Thank you, Alec. Uh, it's, I really appreciate your giving the overview of what uh, what our forests can do for climate adaptation um, in, in Western Maine. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, Joe Roy is going to be up next. Uh, and uh, our, obviously, our Western Maine forests are very valuable for all of the reasons that we have just heard for conservation, for carbon storage. Uh, and, um, and now Joy, uh, Joe is going to uh, elaborate on why are these forests also especially valuable to wildlife? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Roy. I'm a priv uh, the private lands wildlife biologist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And as Amanda has said, I'm kind of here just to provide a wildlife perspective on these forests as, as part of the greater ecosystem here in the state of Maine. I should caveat that I'm, I'm a really big fan of northern hardwoods in the, in the western Maine region. I was born there, raised there, met my wife there, and, and have property there. So I'm very excited to be able to talk to talk here today about that sort of stuff. Um, you know, as Christina kind of alluded to earlier, with showing pictures of things like uh, Canada warblers and things like that, 
Um, the Western Maine forests here and, and our Northern hardwoods are a really important component of uh, wildlife management, really on a global scale. So I just wanna share with you all um, a video. I'm not seeing my share button up share screen here. I wanna share with you all just a little uh, map here that shows kind of some eco regions we have here in the United States. And as you can see here in Western Maine, we have the Northern Forest eco region. And here in the Northern Forest eco region, there are several species that are considered keystone native plants that provide really high value for wildlife. You know, um, a lot of these you'll rec recognize, you know, our Quercus, our Prunus, our Birches, our Poplars, our Apples, and our Maples. And these provide a really important set of ecosystem services because of the amount of food that they provide. You know, birds fly from all over the world to Maine for food. We have a, an immense amount of caterpillar production, insect production. Um, as you can see here, we have, in some of our species are supporting, families are supporting 445 different species of caterpillars. Um, the same can be said with a lot of the shrubs that we see growing in this area. And, you know, our goldenrods, our flowering perennials, goldenrods, you know, are ubiquitous with the size of logging trails and, and, and logging roads, provide just an immense amount of wildlife habitat. And when we're thinking about wildlife habitat, we think a lot about food, space, cover, um, and, and water. You know, we know that the Western Maine Forest is a very large, uninterrupted forest. We know that we have a ton of space for species. We know that we have a ton of food in the form of insects, which just works up trophic levels. So a lot of insects equals a lot of birds, equals a lot of small mammals, um, equals a lot of large mammals, equals a lot of everything. We all know how the food chain works. So this is just highlighting the really great um, value that that region provides to uh, our ecosystem and the ecosystem across the planet, because you think a lot of these species fly from South America to spend time here and then fly back. So if they didn't have a, you know, a, a buffet line to get into when they, once they got up here, their reproduction would be impacted. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out too is, and I'll bring this with, a, with me on Friday for everyone to have, is the Maine Audubon Society in conjunction with Maine Forest Service and IFNW, as well as many other partners, have kind of pulled together a Forestry for Maine Birds guideline that is uh, looking at how to manage forests in Maine to benefit birds. A lot of what Alec just talked about and a lot of what um, Walker has uh, put in his statement about uneven age management, you know, uh, increasing stocking levels, uh, irregular cut of gap cuts over 20 years are all things that are going to benefit carbon storage, but also provide immense amounts of wildlife value. So perfect example, if we look at this Northern Hardwood Associated um, stands, we often find that chestnut warblers are associated with them with caps um, in the canopy that have thick regeneration. So this really just goes to show that management of this forest type is essential for a wide suite of species. And uh, it's gonna be essential for you know, mitigating climate change and providing for great wildlife habitat. The region has not only great fishing, as Christine had talked about, but also really great hunting opportunities for things like rough grouse uh, and woodcock. You know, so there's a large economic value there and we kind of see the dividends from um, proper management of wildlife resources there as it supports agencies and other research and work like that. So I'm gonna be there Friday to talk more and more about wildlife. I'm trying to keep my, my, myself to five minutes here. I'm one to ramble. So hopefully I get that opportunity this, this week, but I'm looking forward to seeing everyone and looking forward to chatting more about wildlife uh, and the importance of this region for wildlife in the state of Maine. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. And I appreciate all of our speakers uh, really keeping to your uh, target uh, time speaking amount. Um, so that's more great information about Western Maine and about the value of this forest, um, especially for wildlife. Um, so what does this all mean to landowners? So uh, we're going to start Julie Davenport for the Maine Forest Service is going to give us a little intro to some of her interactions with landowners and what do they care about what you know what gets them want to take stewardship steps on their land, especially as it relates to climate change or climate adaptation. Um, and then I believe Christine is going to jump back in in a minute or two as well. So go ahead, Julie. Oh, I think you're on mute. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks. So uh, like Amanda said, my name is Julie Davenport. I'm the 
one of the main forest service district foresters. I cover the Western main area. So I've got all of Franklin County. Um, lucky me, that, that's a good place to be. Anyway, that's not what you're here to hear about. So <laughs> um, some of the things that I've been seeing in my own experience covering that area, working with small landowners, um, maybe I should should back up and talk a little bit about, about what I do as a district forester. So um, we're able to meet with small landowners. It's a free service. We can come out and walk their properties with them. Um, basically just a, a resource for folks who wanna learn more about their properties. Um, in the last couple years, kind of since 2020, there's been a huge uptick in folks coming to the Western Main area, purchasing land, looking to be involved with their forest, which, which is great. Um, and, and I've seen that, you know, quite a few of those folks are quite, you know, climate minded and they want to encourage the environmental aspects of their property, sometimes more so than some of just the standard reasons for owning land, whether that be hunting or timber production or whatever. So, so that's been nice to see. Um, <clears throat> I would say from the standpoint of what we're telling folks as far as what they can do on their land in ways that that's kind of changed with a climate mindset is that really at the end of the day, a lot of our recommendations for just doing honest to goodness, good forestry are the same types of practices that, you know, set things up good for climate-based reasons, kind of some of the things other folks alluded to, like um, encouraging biodiversity and having more age group, age classes across the landscape and having just, you know, better stocking levels in certain stands. Those are all really great things that, you know, I think the Maine Forest Service as a whole has really been pushing for for a long time, but now we've kind of got that extra oomph behind it. Um, so that that's been really good. But uh, as far as the landowners themselves are concerned, you know, obviously carbon is a big ticket item that a lot of people ask about, but maybe aren't always necessarily sure what it means. And I think as a whole, we're still trying to figure that out too. Um, there's some new programs available and, you know, people are trying to learn how they, how they work and we haven't completely got all that figured out yet, but uh, it's nice to see some incentives to reward folks for doing good things on their land beyond just the usual tangible things that come from markets like like timber production, um, things that aren't as easily quantified, water quality being one of those key things. Um, that's another thing that we've seen some big changes with with climate is trying to manage for, you know, increased weather events, which means a lot more runoff crossings needs to be sized up significantly. Um, and we've seen a lot more wind throw. So trying to keep that in mind with folks when they're looking to manage their property has been a big deal. It's it's a lot more than just temperature change, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, I hope that I don't want to ramble too much. It's kind of hard to fit everything into five minutes, but I hope that gives a little bit of light about kind of some of the aspects that we're dealing with and looking at working with small landowners. Thank you so much, Jewel. Yes, that's super helpful. And I think that's great context uh, for how you communicate with landowners in your region about all these changes that they're seeing in the forest. Um, Christine, do you wanna jump in? I think you'll get spotlighted. And we'd love to hear a little bit about what's the kind of work you're doing with New England Forestry Foundation and landowner outreach. Sure, thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Julie. Um, we have overlapping efforts, Julie and I, and Maine Forest Service. Joe and I work together a bit, Julie and I do, the Maine Forest Service, Natural Resources Conservation Service District Offices, as well as Maine Audubon's Forestry for Maine Birds. And we refer landowners back and forth. My focus is uh, pretty specific to um, the primary core focus areas that two and a quarter million acres that I pointed out, the High Peaks region of Western Maine. And um, what we're doing at the New England Forestry uh, Foundation is, is different in scope and, and required some different outreach approaches. Um, and it's different in that uh, we're working under the uh, uh, Resource Conservation Partnership Project with the NRCS. And NEF's role is to recruit family landowners uh, and, and some nonprofit landowners like land trusts as well to balance those three things that Alec talked about with a focus on wildlife through the grant. So balancing uh, restoring wildlife habitat with climate adaptation and resilience, increased stocking to grow more merchantable wood over the long term. Um, we're also taking a landscape level approach. So whenever I'm talking to landers, I'm talking about their piece of land, like a jigsaw puzzle piece within the habitat, uh, larger habitat puzzle at landscape scale. And uh, when we work with landowners, uh, we're using the Acadian Forest Standards that, uh, that Alec referred to and we'll probably be talking about 
um, a, a lot more when we're in the field um, based on ecological and forest science to implement those. So uh, we're asking a lot of landowners and it, this became pretty evident to me that workshops and um, you know, uh, the direct mail that we built on that was already happening in Western Maine that we needed to actually advance the outreach to, to recruitment and not just sort of edu uh, education. So that more meant sort of a more activist approach. Um, I call it, I ended up using basically some community action approaches uh, with landowners. But initially what I did was look at the demographic, uh, the US census data and really see um, how people uh, accessed information. This is an older demographic, no surprise, uh, very community oriented print medium, still basically a lot of way and word of mouth is how people find out about information. So I keyed in on that, put up posters relevant to the area and Rangeley, it was care about trout with a beautiful um, you know, picture of a Parham stream. Uh, we do contact us if you're a landowner and have an interest in um, improving wildlife habitat. Let's begin a conversation. There's some reimbursement funds available that brought in a fair bit of people. Uh, and I did that sort of specific to where I was working in Western Maine and what seemed to be the more uh, specific interest. Um, once I, uh, so <laughs> I, t I told Amanda, I, I, I was probably gonna get way too deep in the outreach part of this. But uh, once I, I started to work with landowners, we're, we're asking a 30 year um, ethics pledge, basically. And that's, that's a big ask. You know, yes, there is some reimbursement funds for the habitat uh, restoration practices, which we um, you know, propose in the habitat restoration plan, which acts as a partner plan, with the forest management plan. But we're actually going having those conversations, that, that's what I started with, these deep conversations with landowners. What, what are you seeing on your land? Active la listening techniques. What are you seeing? What do you want your land to be? Uh, how do you see it in 30 years? You know, what, what are your values? And really listening to them, putting their interests absolutely first ahead of the project until I could discern whether this was a, a, a good fit uh, or not. I never say no to landowners. So if it's not a good fit, I uh, think about how I can refer them to something very specific. Uh, uh, whether that's Maine Audubon's Forestry for Maine Birds, which is a wonderful resource, um, Joe Roy, beginning with Habitat Program, and the Maine Foresters. I always mention them. I talk about foresters, the importance of having foresters. So a lot of the same stuff that we all cover in landowner outreach, I try and make it very specific so there's not a lot of stuff to wade through, particularly for landowners I'm talking to that have zero forestry experience. So did this approach work? Well, I took a pretty nimble approach. It did work. Um, so I, um, I ended up doing about 20 minute to one hour conversations with about 80 landowners as a pre-intake phase. So I, I knew where I was headed, looking at beginning with habitat assessments to see what was around them at the landscape scale, see if this was a good opportunity for them and also for the project goals. So those 80 landowners represented about 132,000 acres in Western Maine. And of those, um, our goal was to get 15 landowners representing about 3,000 acres into habitat management. Remember, we're doing those three things, forest management, habitat management, climate adaptation. And we have ended up with about um, 20 landowners and 12,000 acres. Um, and, and that was who have applied, have made their way through the process. I think by the time it all settles out and everybody uh, is contracted, we're gonna end up with about 9,000 acres under management with a 30 year stewardship pledge. And so um, I think what this tells me in terms of outreach is one-on-one -on -one works in Western Maine. There's very few people there, very community oriented. I can talk more uh, in the Q&A if you're interested about how I approach community leaders, how cold calling actually works um, and sort of those community action techniques that I use to sort of advance this from landowner um, um, outreach to actually retention over the last couple of years as we've been working with them. Awesome, thank you so much for all of that, Christine. Um, I'd like to invite all of our speakers to turn your cameras back on now. And uh, we have some questions and I'd love uh, if all of our participants, if you have questions for our speakers that you'd like to hear them address, please type them into the chat window and I'm gonna keep an eye on that chat window. Um, but now that we've heard this really great diversity of perspectives, um, I have a kickoff question for you. What is unique about the Western Maine forest landscape, especially hardwood forests, that makes it especially well suited to forest climate adaptation and carbon mitigation? Anyone is welcome to jump in on that one. 
I can take a stab at it. Um, a couple of things come to mind uh, immediately. One, the fact that, it, that it's an intact forest area that isn't all fragmented with uh, competing land uses like much of the rest of the country. Um, secondly, that we have the elevational gradients uh, that allow um, things to move up and down gradient in response response to climate change. And then a third thing that's striking to me in contrast with other regions of the country is the diversity of species that we're working with. You know, we have 30 plus commercial forest species here in Maine um, that are important. Uh, so we're not dominated by loblolly pine or uh, Doug fir, um, you know, kind of one species, uh, Air emphasis in particular areas. We have a real diversity of species, which makes our forest much more robust and resilient. And I guess that's the other thing that as I think about it, you know, uh, the way you keep something from being forested in Maine is you mow it. And I do that every year on my fields. And if I don't do that, I'm going to have four. So that's not the same as other parts of the country. I was just recently out in California where there are all these acres that have been converted to chaparral from wildfires. They're not coming back. I'm just going to chime in kind of to, to talk about the diversity component as well there, but thinking as a, in the wildlife lens, you know, I think uh, Alex just alluded to one component is, you know, just the sheer magnitude of uninterrupted forests that we have um, provides for the opportunity to manage for species that have massive home ranges. So I think that's a really key thing to think about, um, you know, not necessarily what's just on your property, but what's on your neighbor's property and how that affects the whole landscape. And then with the diversity of forest types and forest stands, you know, it provides the opportunity to have a whole suite of species. You know, at the bottom of your hill, you might have a Swainson's thrush, but you get 2,700 feet up and you have a Big Nels. So we have a whole set of, of diversity of stand types. We also have some diversity in topography, which opens up different opportunities for, for wildlife. You know, we have northern hardwoods, northern mixed wood forests, northern softwood forests. So, you know, as a birder, I know that going up to Eustace and working around the range of the Eustace area, I'm going to get a slew of species that um, can really fill out my year list. So that's always nice. Not to mention, I know that I'm going to be able to go get some absolute top quality um, hunting opportunities and because of all the, the opportunity to hunt um, grouse and woodcock and things of that nature. So really that diverse uh, forest provides for a diverse habitat. And we think about, uh, ecological robustness, especially in the change in climate, having that diversity puts a lot of different um, species in the landscape. So you can see what's what's adjusting to the changes one way versus the other. It just creates a healthy, you know, it lets us know that we have a healthy ecosystem. So. Hey, thanks for that, Joe. Um, I don't know if, uh, if uh, Shelby, if you wanna just talk about what makes that region unique. I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, if you want to just add uh, add your thoughts to the question again, you know, what's unique about the Western Maine landscape um, and, you know, what makes it especially well suited to thinking about carbon and climate kind of uh, at, at the scale that, that you all are working? You want to answer that? Um, right. you can take that one. Referring to hardwood. Yeah. So we're, we're in and out of coverage here a little bit. I think it's our hardwood management is kind of limited on our lands because we have more mix mixed stands and like I was talking to with Walker, um, he suggested that you know the focus here is mainly on spruce fir. And although we do have some hardwood management, there is some opportunity um, doing some single tree and group selection removal just to enhance the growth of the residual stock and that there is some opportunity for carbon storage there. But like I said, it's limited because most of our lands consist of spruce fir in mixed stands. 
Thank you for that. Oh, go ahead, uh, Shelby. Oh, I wasn't. I wasn't going to say anything. I'm sorry. We're just kind of going in and out of Zoom here. Sorry. Just, Thank I'm, you. I apologize. Um, I'll speak just a little bit. Uh, so some of the things that are re really adventitious, and I, I know probably most of the people on this call have probably sat through, um, you know, Kingsley's presentation on the markets in the Northeast, right, for the forest industry. But I think it's it's kind of really good to rehash some of the points that he makes. We have a really unique advantage in the Northeast, not just in Western Maine, that we are situated in a place where we not only have the resource, which is, you know, the timber that's growing, but we're also close to the market. And I think that's something not to discount. Um, it's really important if we are having a conversation at all about managing a natural resource. In this case, it is trees. Having the markets available to actually market those products is what keeps the whole thing as it's like on its own viable. Um, if we lose our markets, we no longer have the tools we need to actually do forest management in the first place. So I think that sets us up well to have a lot of things for opportunity and not the diversity that we do have in Western Maine just solidifies that. Um, if we had entire acreages of only fur and then something happened to the fur, we would be kind of SOL, right? So the fact that we do have those diverse forests helps make sure we can keep our options open and that we can play the game, which is gonna be more and more important as we move forward. There's always gonna be the economic aspects of anything ecological, right? So we have to, we're in a good spot. <laughs> That's a great reminder, Julie. I saw Christine nodding her head and actually we've had several questions come in related to landowner outreach. I'm actually gonna start with uh, Brian's question. So um, he pitched it to Christine, but I'm sure Julie has thoughts on this too. So he says, uh, great success on landowner outreach. To what extent is your work changing the type of forest management that is happening versus providing good and helpful resources to landowners who are looking to practice good forestry for climate and wildlife? Both are good outcomes. You know, I might actually um, put that over to Alec. I mean, I think um, it, it is um, changing. Um, it's, it's doing both. Um, it definitely landowners who come in that I'm working with, they range from folks who know nothing about forestry to folks who are already actively managing with forest management plans and really plugged in. So it's really all over the map. And uh, so are the, so are the sizes of the acreages. I think my smallest landowner is 22 acres and my largest is over a thousand. So, um, and with an average uh, a median of about 250 acres. So I, I, think, uh, I think I might defer to Alec on that, except to say that one of the things that I think is really different is the conversations that we have with landowners and the context within the landscape. Because I'm always talking about, and Joe, I've been in the field with Joe, we, we've done it together, you know, we'll be talking about the parcel we're on. And then I tend to scale it back out. Like here, here you are plunked in this larger landscape. And then we start a dialogue about that. It really draws the landowners in and has them thinking in a different way about their forest management. Keep in mind, and thank you, Julie, for that economic reminder, we're always talking about economic forestry. This is, you know, we're really taking this three-pronged approach. But I might bat that over to Alec just to add on to, if you'd like to, Alec. Okay, so this is all about the work that we're doing that Christine's doing, Carla's doing, Carla Fenner, who also works for us in Northwestern Maine, in which we're hoping to continue through uh, another grant round, and which we're hoping to build on through this climate smart commodities effort, uh, since Christine and Carla have paved the way and showed us that this is indeed possible to get to folks and get them to change their management. Um, so I would say that the kind of, we have to gear it to the NRCS practices in the case of the work that Carla and Christine are doing. And for example, there's a big emphasis for the folks that we're working with to increase the structural complexity of their forest. Going to back to what Joe said a little bit ago about how important it was to have diverse forest conditions and have forests that represent structural diversity so that you maximize the utility of them for a wide variety of species. But the whole game is about trying to get people to practice better management. So yes, Brian, 
If we haven't changed practices at the end of the day, we're not accomplishing our purposes. I just want to add on to that, Amanda, if that's all right, um, too, in that uh, one of the things that sort of developed in the process of doing the landowner retention was this development of sort of unofficial peer ambassadors. And so I really started looking, I used the beginning with habitat to really look at you know, where the conservation lands were, where the habitat had been mapped, and then where the landowners I was working with were, and then how I could build those connections out through the landowner conversations I was having. And so I got uh, some of these landowners who are very invested over time uh, in the process and in their role in this to recruit their neighbors. And so I could really build on that. And some of that, uh, I also just actively cold called people and kept with them to try and build those pieces together across the landscape. We were able to do that successfully, um, de de demonstrably successfully uh, in the Bethel area. I, see. I, mean, I was just gonna chime in real quick. Um, I know the question wasn't for me, but I often chime in anyways. Uh, I think one really great thing to, to answer Brian's question in terms of like how things are changing. I think for many instances, at least with what, who Christine's working with and sometimes who I work with throughout the region, is you're taking people who've gone from a really hands-off approach to people who are now understanding that some sort of active management is important. And just to highlight, for example, um, earlier when I showed the suite of species that provide really good ecosystem services, just going and talking with someone and explaining to them the benefit a certain tree species has, and then you find that they've now kind of adjusted at a small scale, maybe how they're doing their firewood to kind of release that species to allow it to flourish, or maybe instead of selecting trees randomly across their woodlot, they're now kind of creating these gaps through their firewood production um, to create some regeneration. So just getting active management on the landscape versus passive management, I think is a big is a big win too. Awesome, thanks for that, Joe. Um, we had a couple more questions related to landowner outreach and Christine, Bill had one for you. He's wondering what types of landowners um, that you that you focus on. Um, is there a specific type that, you, that you've been targeting and was there a specific approach that you used? Yeah, thanks, Bill, for that question. Um, Bill was probably the first uh, licensed professional forester I was in the field with when I was just trying to figure this all out after I'd just been hired. Um, and so it has evolved quite a bit since then uh, over the last three years. Um, you know, initially, uh, I was pretty much looking for anybody, <laughs> which is when I, you know, when I met Bill, but I think I became much more strategic over time, realizing that that 30 year commitment is a big ask, you know, and so um, you know, how I really focused on landowners, it was still open to anybody who talked to me, but then it was a conversation that developed. And so uh, to, to more specifically answer that in terms of acreage, I tended to look, I tended to assess uh, the folks, the, the land uh, when I was talking to people. First of all, I really wanted to know what they had uh, planned in the next 30 years if we could figure it out together, because it really takes a long-term commitment to do this kind of work effectively. Um, and second, uh, I was looking at what was, you know, what was around them, often uh, pieces of property that were 20 acres to 40 acres, particularly in these strip developments near water like Flagstaff Lake or in, in Upper Enchanted, those areas, um, they were surrounded by development. Uh, and it was, it was hard sometimes to figure out a way to effectively work with them within this project. Um, I would often refer them, as I said, to other options, and, and, and often that was a successful route for them. But what it taught me was I should be looking for people with a little bit larger land um, and strategically, and that's when I started cold calling. You know, I really targeted landowners. I thought, this is one we want. How do I get to them? And some of that was through, um, you know, just community relations, like a, going to talk in strong to the local unofficial land, you know, leader, community leader, who do you know? Like, can you do an introduction for me? Um, and, and those worked. So I think Bill, it evolved over time. And the other thing that really evolved that Julie mentioned was over the last three years, there's been an increasing interest among existing and new landowners um, in carbon and climate. They're asking. They want to know. Thank you for that. Um, and that ties into the next pair of questions. So Sam is wondering, are your landowners involved in any carbon projects? If so, how is the process for smaller landowners? And a related question, Alex is wondering, where do you see the logging industry in carbon projects in reference to their emission? So I don't know if Christine wants to take the first and Alex might pick up with the industry response. Oh, run it by me one more time, Amanda, sorry. 
Sorry, the first one was, uh, are, are your landowners involved in any carbon projects? If so, how is the process for smaller landowners? I think the process is really similar to wildlife because even though we're working sort of under these grants that focus on wildlife, it's integrated. We're looking at climate adaptation and, you know, the carbon piece of it is evolving. Um, but, you know, people are interested. They want to know if they can make it all fit together, wildlife carbon and uh, economic forestry. You know, most people have the wildlife uh, sort of uh, preference, but there's increasing interest in putting all of those together. Um, I am not working with anyone who's specifically, um, you know, looking at carbon uh, markets yet. I imagine that's going to happen really, really soon. Awesome. And then, Alec, if you could follow up thinking about, uh, I guess, the larger industry. So where do you see the logging industry and carbon projects in reference, in reference to their emission? Okay. Boy, I don't get off. I don't often get asked to represent the industry perspective. This may be a first, so that's great. Um, let me say that the uh, if what you're asking about is the importance of the emissions from logging, and let's broaden that to transportation of wood uh, to mills, uh, everything that I've seen, and we've worked specifically on some life cycle analyses looking at the question of how does wood compare um, with other materials, um, it, it's not very significant in the overall scheme of things, the emissions from harvesting and transportation. And let me just elaborate a little bit on that. And that is to say that we have a really big opportunity. So Chad Oliver and um, uh, Bruce Lipke, did an analysis and said, what if we were to use a bigger proportion of the wood that the planet is already growing to substitute for other materials? And their conclusion was, if we did use some or all of that material, the impact that we could have on global carbon emissions is between 14 and 31%. So we don't just have opportunities in this region we have opportunities worldwide. Our opportunities differ a little bit. Every region is going to be somewhat uh, different. But the opportunities that are provided by substituting wood for other materials, so for example, it takes about 10 times as much energy to make a steel stud as it does a wooden stud. These opportunities are really significant and can make really put forests on the map and forest products on the map as a way to mitigate climate change. Thank you for that, Alec. Uh, I see we just have a couple of minutes left. So uh, Meg or Aaron, I'm wondering if I ought to pitch it back to you in just a moment um, to, <laughs> to try to wrap things up officially so we can let people go at the top of the hour if they need to go do something else. Um, but I think, let me just, I guess I'll hit pause. There are more great questions that are coming in. Um, we might be able to stick around and answer a couple after the top of the hour, but this has uh, been really, really great discussion. I feel like we're just in one hour just scratching the surface, which is why we have a field tour on Friday. So um, again, I think Aaron dropped the link uh, to the Friday field tour registration. So if you haven't signed up, uh, please do. Um, so it would be great to, uh, to see you on Friday in the field um, at the uh, Sorry, at the, the Stephen Phillips Memorial Preserve um, and get to see some hardwood uh, management in action. Um, and there'll be yeah much more discussion to have. We're on for a few more minutes um, after the top of the hour. I know folks are gonna need to go. Um, let me just remind you, if you're looking for SAF credits, please make sure that your name appears correctly in Zoom because we're gonna submit the list of participants to SAF for credits. Um, and Meg has, uh, will we'll be sending in that list. Um, so before we let everybody go who has to go, um, please join me in a virtual round of applause for our speakers today. Thank you so much for your time and for your efforts and initiative in really uh, bringing great forestry to Western Maine. This is fabulous and I'm so excited. Um, Friday's gonna be an awesome field tour. You're getting lots of applause icons uh, in the Zoom window. So great job, everybody. Amanda, I wanted to add one thing about um, upcoming in June. We still are planning a bonus webinar along these lines, but word will go out through the email system to let you know more about that. 
Great, thank you. And Bill's wondering, where are we meeting on Friday? Well, you need to register and you'll get an email reminder, but the uh, the, the boat um, the boat park and ride in Aquasic is uh, gonna be the, the meeting place. So for everybody who has to go right now, thank you um, for joining us for this hour. And if you have more questions, we can stick around for just a few more minutes um, and uh, we'll do our best to address a few of those. Whew. So um, thank you again. Um, one question we didn't get to, um, we didn't get to cover. I know that uh, Shelby and Jason are having some uh, technical issues over there, but you had a question about the use of drones um, in, in your management. Um, so we did actually get to do a webinar on that and Logan shared a link to it. Um, so hopefully that covers it, but Jason, if you can hear and talk, you're welcome to just add a little bit more about the use of drones um, in management. Sure, yeah, um, I, I know using drones, we can determine species composition, uh, stand density, stand size and structure, but uh, we can also, they equip these drones with NIR sensors. And from what I understand, it's a blue, green, infrared. So healthy trees will reflect the, the red light and unhealthy trees will absorb the infrared and it'll glow blue. So this is kind of useful identifying unhealthy stands and sort of in need of remediation that we can get on pretty quickly. So that's that's pretty cool, as well as uh, producing high quality orthographic imagery and 3D elevation models, things like that. That's awesome. Thank you for that answer. Um, and that kind of ties to one other question that we didn't quite get to. Uh, Richard is asking, what are the current major threats to forests in the area? And what are some of the challenges to regenerating areas that are experiencing mortality? Are you asking one of us Any, over here? <laughs> any, anyone is welcome to answer. Yeah. Um, I'll chime in on that. Uh, sorry, you were you going to talk? Oh, nope, go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Uh, I was going to mention a couple things that I see are undoubtedly development. Um, folks are able to do their jobs from anywhere now, and that can include the beautiful high peaks western region of Maine. So um, lots of, you know, I think fragmentation is a real threat. You know, folks with the financial means to buy a big piece of land and plunk a house in the middle of it and not ever cut it again because they don't want to is... Uh, a real problem. But I think the other thing you mentioned specifically regeneration, um, it's not really a huge problem in Western Maine yet, but uh, undoubtedly invasive plants are, are just wreaking havoc on the landscape. I think across the entirety of New England, um, it's, it's going to be a bigger and bigger problem, I think, until it becomes so big that people can't pretend it's not anymore. So... That, that would be my take on what some of the biggest challenges are. I'd love to hear what other folks think. I can just kind of chime in to say uh, what Julie just pointed out as a major challenge for forestry is a major challenge for wildlife as well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our species have very particular uh, ranges that they need to encompass. A lot of species require interior forests. Uh, and if you, you have fragmentation, you don't have as much of that available. Uh, the beginning with habitat has a great tool on our maps where you can click to see how large a, a portion, if you have a woodlot, what portion of the land around you is undeveloped. And then if you look in Western Maine, there's still areas where have that have hundreds of thousands of connected undeveloped acres, which is really valuable. And invasive species just take the place of a native species uh, and they outcompete and they remove the native species off of off of the landscape and that just really impacts the wildlife habitat you know while honeysuckles and winter berries both have red berries they don't have the same nutritional components and they don't have the same habit provide the same habitat features and, and, and necessary components for wildlife so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh i'd like to just build on what julie and joe have said and i agree with all of it uh that they said and particularly the business about fragmentation. Um, this region, one of the things that makes it unique, uh, as shown by that map from the National Wild, uh, Wildlife folks, uh, is the fact that the forest is intact. 
it's harvested, it has roads through it, but it doesn't have big areas of competing land uses. And we need to be very vigilant, I think, if we want to keep the special values of this area to make sure that that doesn't change significantly over time. And uh, I am particularly concerned with things like the decision by the Land Use Planning Commission to change the adjacency rules, which opens up um, hundreds of thousands of acres to development without having to go through the, pro the process that it did before. And we've seen a big uptick. There was an article in Maine Biz, I think was the publication on the uptick in building permits that's occurring in the unorganized territories. So I think that that is an absolutely critical issue. Um, another <laughs> issue that I would say is important is we're not providing the financial incentives for um, landowners uh, that they need to practice the best forestry that they can. So that's something we need to change as well. Uh, thank you for, for both of those, Alec. Um, I think that that really underscores the work that the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust is doing. Um, Shelby, do you have, if you can, if you have a good connection, do you want to say any final yeah. words on that? Thank you. And, and we will agree with all three, Ju um, Julie, Joe, and Alec, and what they said. Uh, we've seen a, um, a dramatic difference between 911 and now. And of course, since COVID 19, we've seen a lot more fragmentation of smaller parcels and uh, more people move into town. It's becoming harder and harder for our, our year round residents to find housing. And it's, it's so not just in the and the forested angle, looking at the more cultural and social issues that come along with these observations are quite significant. Thank you for that. I think we'd probably better wrap up there. Um, I know we can keep on going, but that's why we have a field trip planned for Friday. So many thanks again to our speakers. Thanks again to everybody who joined us today and who stuck around for an extra seven minutes after the top of the hour. Uh, Friday is going to be fabulous. And I really, really appreciate your time and being part of this uh, webinar today to help get everybody set up for Friday's field tour. Thanks, everyone.